Stan speculates in one of his earlier books, Personality and Evolution, that Cro-Magnon was a highly evolved um, aggressive aggressor and that his primary instinct wasn't libido but was instead aggression and that this came from his um, his gibbon evolution so gibbons gibbons today are, are extremely territorial they have uh, they, they bond in a pair they form a nuclear family they have a small piece of territory that they patrol every morning and they attack anything that comes within their territory they live extremely high up at the tops of trees. They spend most of their time in the canopy, swinging around, so away from the ground. Almost like they live in a castle or a skyscraper where you get the high ground. And this, um, this pair bonding and aggression seem to go together. So the, the, if, a, if an animal bonds as a pair, they are uh, tend to stay away from other from others of their species. They might live alongside them in a territory, but they'll have their own ground that nobody's allowed into, no other gibbon is allowed into, say. And we still don't really know where he was from, he just appears in the fossil record. He was probably very isolated wherever he was. He had a very tough evolution. Life was not easy for him because wherever he was, food was scarce. There was a lot of competition. Um, you had to be very, very aggressive and dominant and small, form small units uh, to be able to just feed a small unit rather than a, a big troop. They also fought with mega, mega fauna, so large, maybe relic dinosaurs or um, Komodo dragons or these, you know, big, aggressive animals that would take a lot of skill to be able to take down and uh, would very quickly weed out the gene pool and and only leave behind the the most aggressive, the the, the most skilled. Um, you know, cro on men and women. Um, they were tall, blonde, blue-eyed, with pale skin, um, and they had evolved these juvenile traits into adulthood in order to be able to work together. So when it came to tackling big problems like giant animals, you know, relic dinosaurs or whatever it was that was left behind. They needed some way of being able to come together to be able to tackle these problems together. And so their, their instinct to be able to attack each other was turned off by them, turn, them growing up into, into giant babies, into giant blonde haired, blue eyed, pale skinned, juveniles but they were they were you know six foot and they still retained all of those traits into adulthood and this gave them some chance with each other of not attacking each other um, they were still very individual individualistic and kept to themselves in their little family units but when they needed to come together when a threat was when when something threatened them as a as a as a as a species, they was able to come together um, through this, you know, this this evolution of the 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 body, the face, the hair, everything, the eye color, and even though they were aggressive, it somehow was enough to prevent them being so aggressive with each other that they wiped each other out because they didn't want to wipe each other out, and eventually this forms into. Um, a sort of tribe of people that are still antagonistic towards each, towards each other, but more antagonistic towards outsiders than they are towards each other. And Stan speculates that this is where handshakes come from. It's a, the handshake is a form of gift giving, um, and gift giving is used to inhibit 
the aggression instinct in somebody. So when somebody is trying to make peace with somebody, they might bring a gift around with them or and that will present the gift to the person. Or if you want to break down someone's um, defences, you'll offer your hand as a, you know, a handshake. And that will then let that person know that you're, you're not there for bad purposes, that you're, you're willing to shake their hand. And, you know, these are stylized versions of gift giving. Um, some people present, they take a child with them if they're really, really looking for, you know, for that person not to attack them, they'll take their child, please, you know, and it's a way of, of, uh, of inhibiting the desire or the instinct to attack, is to present yourself with your hand out or a gift, because that stops the, the other adult attacking you. And these are all instincts, these are all, these are all things that have been put in place millions of years ago that we still use today to, to uh, sort of preempt language. And Cro-Magnon evolved the pointed chin, which was then accented with a beard. And so Caucasians tend to grow bigger beards than anybody else in the world. And this is because they contain a bit more Cro-Magnon. The chin would have been the primary place for punching each other. So their form of fighting would have been that they put the chin up and then they fight by hitting each other in the chin. Um, and obviously this is extrapolated back from our societies now where we have formalised forms of this, such as boxing. Um, and we have phrases like keep your chin up or stiff up a lip or a strong jaw, somebody has a strong jaw, or somebody has a weak jaw. Um, but the jaw is used as, this, as a symbol of aggression or stylized aggression, and that the beard grows on the end of this, this really important part of the face. And uh, we find this in other animals where they've got something, an appendage that is used for fighting, such as deers or um, buffalo where they butt each other on the head and we find that that, that area where they, where they butt each other is actually accented with not just the bony ridge but also some hair on top of it. So they grow a thick clump of hair on there or the deer grows big thick, piece, big, thick hairs out of the top of its head which are its antlers. And so the, the chin is accented by a beard and that beard is 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 used for fighting between men and uh, as we've moved on through the times the beard has become a, a symbol of intelligence or intellect so you'll see a lot of the old philosophers had long beards or um, kings or you know people who had a high social standing would have a would have a big beard. And then the other thing is the shoulders. So you get this um, this general, this whole look of people who are highly aggressive where they bring their, they bring their shoulders up, they, have, they bring their shoulders up to be broader, they bring their chest out. And in humans, we actually find, with men, we find like a line of hair across here, and then the hair goes up from there and down from there, whereas in, primates we find all the hair drops down off of the shoulders and runs down to the down the body but in humans we just find this line in males we find a line where the hair goes up from one point and down from the other and the, what that actually does is creates a bigger look to the chest when you're when you when you're naked and so this would have been something that could be seen from long from far away so one Cro-Magnon could have seen from far away that the other Cro-Magnon had a big chest and was therefore an adult or grown up or able to fight. So then they would, you know, they would, that would be their way of picking whether they want to fight somebody or not, or whether that person's an adult or a threat. If they don't have that hair marking, then they're not really a threat. If they don't have the beard, they're not really a threat. They also would have bowed their head in submission. 
rather than presenting the buttocks like Neanderthal man or like other primates. And so you had the chin being raised when they was ready to fight. And then you had the chin being lowered when they were ready to submit. Thank you.